Welcome to the 34 Motorsports Product Showcase. We're proud to offer the full line of Simpson Racing safety products. The Shark Speedway is a perfect brain bucket to keep your melon as safe as possible. We carry every model and size of Hans device, and these have saved countless lives. The Hybrid Pro Lite is an alternative to the Hans device and is just as effective. The DNA three-layer suit offers maximum protection when things get hot. And hey, dude, those comfy shoes won't help one bit when things go south. Keep those hands ready to work with a pair of Vortex FIA gloves meeting every current standard. From five to seven points, we carry every one of the Simpson harnesses, keeping your rear end right where it should be. Keep all your gear clean and together with the helmet and FHR bag and always be ready to hop in a race car. Visit 34motorsports.com and order today. I'm Ryan Newman, and since I started with Indiana Donor Network and Driven to Save Lives, I found out that some people think that they can't be an organ donor. The truth is, anyone can sign up to be an organ donor. Anyone? Anyone? Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Anyone can sign up to be an organ donor. So don't count yourself out because somebody's counting on you. Go to driventosavelives.org and sign up today. But my heart's going to you, Ryan. Love that shirt. And good evening, everybody, and welcome to the High Side Hustle right here on the National Racing Network. Your favorite two slap nuts are back together once again for more shenanigans. My name is Bert Wojcik. Alongside me, as always, is Big Sexy Adam Rubright and our executive producer, Chris Graham. Big Sexy, how are you doing tonight, bud? I'm good. How are you? I see you have your uh, March Madness hat on. If you would have told me, I would have put on my, my Miami Hurricanes one because we are still dreaming, baby. Put on the U. Still dreaming. Yes, Mike. My Villanova Wildcats, they play here in just a couple minutes, and we'll get to enjoy a little bit of that as, as uh, we're going to have a little bit of a different show for you here tonight, folks, as uh, we're going to change things up just a little bit from our normal, for, our normal forte or how we do everything here. So, uh, obviously, uh, 34 Motorsports ticker down below, you can have all the results and that. So, we're going to do things a little bit different here tonight. We're actually going to take a commercial break here after I'm done talking here. Um, we're going to go into our in real quick here with uh first off on the Fredericksburg Eagle Hotel hotline we're going to have uh Hannah Newhouse from the World of Outlaw Case Late Model Series and also Dirt Vision um Hannah was fantastic enough to give us some time on Tuesday night and we had a fantastic interview which normally we try and put these interviews at about uh 20 25 minutes half hour most we were having so much fun it went on for 50 minutes so the first Pretty much 50 minutes of the show are going to be that interview. It was a lot of fun. We had a blast with it. And then when we come back, we'll be live. And then around 8 o'clock, we're going to have the Ringo's Rocket. He picked up the win at Cherokee Speedway back a couple weeks ago with the uh, Hallmark Elite Series. And then he just picked up the Speed Showcase 40 of Port Royal uh, with the South Region on Sunday. Ryan Godown is going to be joining us here. Uh, in just a little bit, who picked up over $30,000 in the last month. And we're only not even a month in the season yet in Modified. So it's crazy. So what we're going to do this, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be back with, Ernie Viewer, for, with Hannah Newhouse. And we will see you guys in a little bit. And we'll be live with Finch's Meat Markets news and notes after that. We'll just Because I think something happened at Port Royal on Sunday. I, 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 the internet didn't blow up or anything. Did you hear about it, Adam? I, I didn't hear anything about it. I I can't recall anything out of the ordinary. 
We'll have to do some digging during the uh, during the interviews. But anyway, stay tuned, folks. You're watching the High Side Hustle. When we come back, Hannah Newhouse and the Frederick Eagle Hotel Hotline. Stay tuned. I'm heading out, man. You want to ride? No, I got my car, but I actually really need to go to the bathroom. Dude, are you okay? I am definitely buzzed. Yeah. I think I will take this, and I will take that ride home. If there's one thing every car guy hates, it's cleaning the garage. Do you want to take most of the time and hassle out of that job? Then call Zone Garage of Eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Agnes and her crew will have your garage, shop, basement, or even your porch looking great all the time. With unique patterns and designs, plus the ability to incorporate your logo or any artwork, your space will never have looked better. Installation is done in one day, guaranteed, and Zone Garage offers a 20-year warranty on the top coat. Their coatings are durable, anti-slipped, and impact resistant. Give them a call at 570-856-6067. That's 570-856-6067 for Zone Garage of Eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Racing Network, Burt Wojcik, Adam Rubright with you. Join us now on the Fredericksburg Eagle Hotel Hotline. We continue our Women Motorsports segment here for Women's uh, History Month here. And we have the pit reporter with the World of Outlaw Case Late Model Series. How many times I had to tell myself this week, Hannah, it's the Case Late Model Series because I'm still getting used to that name. I'm sure it's not easy for you. But anyways, ladies and gentlemen, the great Hannah Newhouse has joined us here. Hannah, thank you so much for taking some time out with us, please. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks so much for having me on. And like you said, uh, all through Sunshine Nationals and Volusia and that whole spiel, it uh, I almost had to like write it on my hand a couple of times to make sure that I remembered it was the case construction, you know, late models, and it wasn't Morton Buildings. Like it, it's it's gonna slip up. I know it's gonna slip up at some point this year. So what you need to do is like uh, get a jar. Cause I remember back when I was a kid on ESPN, <laughs> yeah. they had a jar when they went from Bush Nationwide. Like ESPN would put it on like a dollar in there every time they did that you need to do that for when you uh um you guys slip up with that i think that'd be a good way to put the purse on there yeah between me and rick eshelman we also have a new sponsor for our heat races so it's not driving anymore the amount of times that we say driving heat race winner and there's a bunch of new title sponsors that came on with us this year so that bucket would fill up real fast Absolutely. And I, I think, yeah, you and Rick, you definitely put a couple bucks in there. More Rick than anything, I think. No one Rick? Yeah. Probably, yeah. yeah. But, hey, hey uh, great to have you on here with us tonight. And uh, are we seeing some racing this weekend? Please say yes, because it is so I, – I miss watching the case ladies. It feels like it's been forever since we had a chance to talk to you guys about a race. And I pray to God we're seeing some races this weekend. Please say yes. Yeah, the weather looks really good for Cherokee, actually. So that's the nice thing is we've got Cherokee on Friday and Saturday. And then a lot of guys that are actually going to pull double duty on um, Thursday, we've got a makeup race for the Extreme Dirt Car Series at Lakeview Motor Speedway. Uh, weather does not look great for that race at the moment. But Cherokee, fortunately, it looks really nice. Nice as in, like, it's going to be cold, but there's no rain in the, in the vicinity. So we should be racing this weekend because I agree with you. It feels like it's been forever since I've been to a dirt lane model race. It it feels like forever. I mean, since, yeah, I mean, since you guys have raced anyways, what, since Volusia, I think? Because, what, you've been rained out the last three, four races that you, you have. We, me and Adam, we were talking here. Um, we were disappointed we didn't get the rev because we were so looking forward to that place for how good the racing's been down there. But the start to your guys' season, I, I think it's been kind of a – uh, a strange one here. Some of the names that obviously Smokey's been one of the guys that's been up there at the start, but uh, Dale McDowell, what a comeback story for him. Uh, that uh, two wins already on the season for him. I mean, that's that's impressive. That's something I wasn't expecting, especially with the comeback uh, from the way or from what he's had to go the last uh, year. Yeah, no, that was so cool to see, especially starting the year off right at like Sunshine Nationals with that win for Dale and to kind of go into Volusia and Dirt Car Nationals being the points leader. And of course, um, yeah, that was, I don't think that was on any radar, including his own. And he'll tell you that as well. You know, he just wanted to get back to racing, didn't really have any expectations set and to go and have two wins, be the only two time winner uh, with world of outlaws so far this year has been, has been interesting. And just the kind of the storylines, like you said, 
it's been uncharacteristic like of the late model series so far this year with the return of Josh Richards and he has not been living up to the standard that he set himself um, hasn't really had a great start to the year you know nor has Brandon Shepard uh, as far as the world of outlaw stuff you know he had a couple wins with Lucas Oil down south but you know hasn't had the world of outlaw season so far that he's wanted to uh, some rookies that are up there for it you know in the top three top five in points so, you know, I enjoy, I think Cherokee will be a give, you know, with Chris Madden if he comes and runs with us because he's actually scheduled, believe it or not, he is scheduled to go to Bristol. So mm. uh, point upset there because that is our current points leader in the world of Outlaw Case Late Models. He's scheduled to go to Bristol. So if that rains out, of course, he'll probably be on board with us. But uh, only time and Mother Nature will tell. Yeah, I'll say that. I, I'm smoky. I, I feel like... I don't know. I feel like Smokey would come. I don't know. He might go to Bristol for the money because he's not signed up for any series, right? Well, he's technically platinum with us. Okay. So he is signed up with us. But that's not to say there are quite a few drivers that sign up platinum and they usually do it at the beginning of the year at Volusia mm -hmm. and kind of see how things pan out. But um, three weeks ago, Chris Madden was going to be at Cherokee. And as of last week, Per his crew, guys, he is not coming to Cherokee. They're going to go to Bristol. So uh will be interesting to see how that pans out because he's obviously like the shoe-in for a win at Cherokee mm -hmm. this weekend. And then he's also good at Farmer City, which we go to next week. That has no conflict, so he's probably going to be at Farmer City. And like the concept of having a driver probably have multiple wins, be leading the points, and drop off the tour after Farmer City is just mind-blowing to me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Really and doesn't sorry, make a whole lot of sense. No, it, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I don't know what I missed there. Sorry, I was having some internet issues. So, <laughs> good old school county internet. Yeah, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But I, I guess you go chasing the money. I mean, but then again, also there's good money with the outlaws this year. I feel like that it was. Um, I feel like that the Outlaws have stepped up their game the last year and a half, or is he, like to really kind of compete with Lucas Oil. I felt like you know the last couple of years Lucas Oil kind of had to look like the, the I don't know like maybe the better driver count, but yet the quality the races have been on the World of Outlaws side. Now I think that gap has closed a lot the last couple of years here, don't you think? Especially with the way the Outlaws have really bumped their uh, bumped their pay scale up as well. Oh yeah, there's definitely incentive with now being a points racer. You know, I feel like the last couple of years, there was no incentive to go and points race because the weekly payout wasn't great. So essentially you had to just make that commitment in February to run a 60, 70 race schedule to get paid out in November. Instead of these guys that were going and only running a 25 race schedule and having a better chance at, you know, getting big paychecks throughout the year. So that definitely made it difficult on a lot of the guys that run full time and I get it. Um, you know, you got to make, you got to make money to keep racing. And if you're not making that money and if you're not a, if you're not a, a, a big race contender, I could see why points racing would maybe make more sense to you because you're going to have those weekends where there's three series scheduled on top of each other. It's just inevitable. And you do get that top five finish and that's a good pay spot. So it's been cool to see, you know, world racing group and the outlaws take that initiative to try and make points racing financially beneficial again both in the short term with higher payout weekly races you know our regular friday saturday shows as well as end of the year payout so and and the drivers and teams have said the same thing you know we got new interest uh from a couple guys that have committed including like your tanner english and your gordy gundicker and you know so right as of right now shane clinton and tyler bruning so we've got both capital cars that are uh, with us full time so you know you just gotta put that incentive out there and hope they come yeah, definitely. And, and what the World Racing Group and the Outlaws and and everyone at on the late model side of things, even the sprint car side, has been doing is the last couple of years is they've been slowly kind of introducing this higher pay structure towards the end of the season, but also on the weekly side of things. Because, I mean, let's face it, for the longest time, it felt like you could win a good rate paying race here and a good paying race here, and it was almost basically the same week in and week out except for like you know your crown jewel events that's when you really saw the, the price increase on things yeah absolutely and it was just a survival game at that point you know you just hoped that you 
busted even with tow money and what you made if you made the feature, you know? So that's, that was, that was tough. And there's going to be a couple races where, you know, you get 40, 50 car fields and they're world about one points races. So how do you keep your guys that maybe don't run top 15 in those competitive races, you know, keep them coming back? Like, how do you keep that incentive there for those situations like your farmer city and your prairie dirt classics and your, you know, USA nationals, how do you keep that incentive there? And so building that overall purse at the end of the year is I feel like where you keep your guys on that maybe aren't your one, two, three, top five runners, but they're getting that incentive at the end of the year compared to racing locally. Yeah, absolutely. And before we get our, get off this, uh, the outlaws uh, topic here, uh, is this the year Brandon Shepard gets knocked off? Cause that's, uh, it's uh, obviously the start of the year has been where he's at, but I asked Rick this question back in May, is this year or last year? <laughs> And uh, when you guys ran for Pennsylvania, and it, it proved me so wrong. But Shepard did not have a good start to the year so far. Is this year Brandon Shepard gets knocked off, or is it way too early to tell? You know, I think it's too early to tell just because Brandon Shepard's shown that he can hit a midseason stride, and that team doesn't need more than a race or two to really just sit down and rethink everything and come back in attack mode. I mean, they're obviously a well-oiled machine. Um, if I could tell you that Chris Madden was going to commit to the full schedule and not potentially flake out, I would say that this is the year that Brandon doesn't win the championship because Chris is also so consistent. He was top three, top five, no matter where we went, unless he had technical problems. But Brandon's had a couple races like that too. Didn't have a good start where Chris didn't have a good start last year, Brandon did, and it was still those two for the points about three quarters of the season. And Chris has a great start to the season, and Brandon not so much. So Brandon's going to be playing catch-up all season long. So I, if, if Chris Madden stays on the tour, I'll say yes. But if not, I feel like the next class of the field is obviously Brandon Shepard. Absolutely. But, like, honestly, if I'm – Smoky right now. I'm like, man, I'm in, I'm in the the catbird seat here. Like, let's see if we can just keep this rolling. And well, maybe who knows? Halfway down the season, halfway through the season, you know, luck changes and B Chef is out front by a mile. Then maybe you know, drop off the tour. But like, if if I'm out front this early in the season, you know, it's it would be kind of hard for me personally to not want to just like, all right, let's see how far we can take this. Yeah, I'm a big Chris Madden fan personally, just as far as, like, his team. They've always been so nice to me. They were one of the first people to really, like, bring me in and teach me the, you know, technical side of the dirt light models. And, you know, both of his crew guys, uh, Ricky and Goose, are so nice. Um, so I'm a Chris Madden fan, you know, in an unbiased way. But he's also unpredictable. Like, I just never know what I'm going to get with him, whether that's in an interview, <laughs> whether that's in a conversation, whether he's going to show up at the racetrack being the points leader, like Chris Madden races for Chris Madden. And so Chris Madden does what he wants. And uh, yeah, you just never know what you're going to get with him. Ain't that fun when you don't know what you're going to get from somebody, <laughs> especially in an interview. I mean, I, I, that's what I love about, you know, you do these interviews and you don't know what you're going to get. And those guys that you can be loose cannon sometimes. They're great. That that makes for the best content, I feel like. And that's when you get excited to, like, go talk to these guys. I know I get that way after, you know, a sprint car race, say, after, I, I don't know, if I uh, – or whatever it is. You know, mostly, you know, I've been doing a lot of sprint car stuff up here. But mostly you go over to a guy like Danny Dietrich after the race. You don't know what the hell you're going to get out of Dietrich. And I'm sure Mad's the same way for you guys. You got those guys that you don't know what you're going to get out of them every interview. Yeah, 9 out of 10, Madden usually gives me a pretty, you know, decent interview – but I feel like it's more the candid comments prior and post uh, that crack me up and, you know, maybe spin me off my kilter a little bit before I go into the interview. And then, you know, you've got your Brandon Shepard that took NASCAR training, basically. You know, I can tell I can tell you what he's going to say before he tells me what he's going to say. And then, you know, I love some of the newer, fresher faces that have kind of come in because uh, they keep me on my toes, too. Like Gordy, I never know what Gordy's going to say. You know, Tanner English, I feel like, gives great interviews in the sense that he's he's real and he's raw with them. They're not cookie cutter, you know, interviews. And then you've got like Shane Clanton, who I never know what to expect with Shane Clanton because he could be 
mad at the track prep and I'm going to hear all about it. And so is everyone else on Dirt Vision when I interview him. And I'm like, shame, shame. We can't do this right now. Um, but again, he's also been like, I have been super fortunate. I feel like that pretty much everyone in that, you know, environment has been so nice and so welcoming to me as someone who's relatively new to this scene. Uh, but they keep me on my toes. They enjoy that. Yeah. And that's actually uh, leads good to question here. Let's get into you a little bit here because uh, you are relatively new to the dirt late model scene, relatively new. Uh, I, I wouldn't say to dirt in general, but it is uh, a little bit out of your comfort zone. Tell us how we got to this point here and how do we get over to the World of Outlaw case uh, construction late model series? Well, it's a, it's a long journey. To give you the short synopsis of just how I kind of ended up with the late models is um, there's a little bit of new direction over at Dirt Vision, uh, who is kind of our GM over there named Jim Chappelle, who I kind of know from the pavement world, just in the sense that he comes from the world of speed channel and, you know, directing a network, and at the end of 2020, yeah, end of 2020, um, you know, I'm, I'm contractor, so I work for 10 different people all year, every year, piecing together weekends, you know, five weekends at a time, and I'd reached out to him at the end of 2020, hearing that he'd end up at Dirt Vision, and was like, hey, I don't know if you have any openings, but I would love to expand my horizons. I've always been intrigued by it. Um, any and all opportunities just to grow my craft. And he was like, yeah, you know, I'll think about it. I'll let you know. But as of right now, we have all of the roles filled for 2021. And I was like, okay. And he called me in January or February of 2022, 2021 and goes, hey, I have 12 races for you. And it's during the summer national stint. But the catch twenty five, like the catch is, you have to take all of them. You can't take some of them. You're either gonna take all of them or none of them, because I need someone to fill that whole gap. And I was like, I have three conflicting NASCAR races those weekends. I was gonna work Pocono, Gateway, and I don't know Richmond or something like that. Um, and so I called my MRN folks and I was like, Hey, I got to give up three races, but I gain. 12 over here what do you what do you think and they were like well that's what you want to do we'll figure it out so i took off three nascar races thinking that i was just going to work 12 dirt late model races and that would be the end of it and about race four or five in we started sitting down and talking about 2022 and they were like you know we like working with you and i we feel like you like working over here so if that's something you want to do we need you to commit to the full late model schedule and i was like that is a lot of races. Um, and I obviously had an absolute blast, loved the environment. I say when people ask me that the World of Outlaw Late Models, to me, is like short track racing meets NASCAR. In the sense that these guys have multi-million dollar operations. They are top-notch. Some of the smartest guys out there. Some of those badass raw drivers out there as well. But... As soon as the races are over, everyone closes their gates. Everyone's walking around with a beer. You can go in anyone's trailer and have dinner. You know, the guys that just wrecked each other are usually hanging out with each other. Like, everyone helps each other in the pits. Like, it's short track racing at the soul with an external NASCAR view. You know what I mean? And it was just such a cool change of scenery after having been in the NASCAR world for five years um, that I was like, I think I, think I want to keep doing this. So... Here I am. <laughs> it's one way, definitely one awesome way to put it in, in your own words there. But how how do you get so comfortable with interviewing people, you know, when one day you're doing interviews for NASCAR and the next day you're halfway across the country doing a, a World Battle Late Model interview or so on and so forth? But like, how do you juggle your interviews and like your your homework for who you're going to be talking to when it comes to the, the multiple different series that you used to cover yeah i mean last year i think we did the math and i think i covered like eight different disciplines of racing across 12 series and like everything from sports cars to road course to motocross and durocross uh i mean it just came down to like you said doing your homework you know you kind of usually know a couple weeks prior what you're doing and I've got kid you not an excel spreadsheet 
of where I'm at every single day, all year long. My fiance has the same one. He works for NBC as a pit reporter, so he's all over the place. Um, and it's just, it's just doing your homework, you know, in NASCAR, we're spoiled because we have unlimited resources available to us. You know, they, they send us pre-statistic packages prior to each race on telling you how everyone's finished at this racetrack and how they're, what their average is and all that stuff. So it's super easy on the NASCAR side of things, but the dirt side and the enduro cross side, and even kind of the Indy car side and the Insta side, like you gotta do some research. You gotta dig these people up. And at the end of the day, I feel like most of your research is done at track. You know, you hit the ground, you go make that introduction, you kind of cultivate and know the questions that need to be asked based on whatever the discipline is. And then at the end of the day, broadcasting is relative, right? Like you have the baseline of what needs to be known after each race, after each heat race, during redraws, whatever it is. And then you build your knowledge based on the interviews that you do when you're getting note taking. So um, not gonna lie, the first couple of years that I was broadcasting, I was absolutely scared out of my mind to go do anything outside of pavement <laughs> short track racing and NASCAR because I'd just been so comfortable. And then I found myself in a position where I didn't have enough work to sustain just doing that. So I had to branch out and it was everything from, you know, like I said, midgets and sports cars and I mean, you name it. At this rate, I think the only thing that I haven't honestly done in the United States is like motor or broadcasting wise is NHRA. I haven't done any drag racing yet. Um, but it's been so much fun. Like I Key look forward yet. to new challenges now. Yes. Yes. Keyword. Keyword yeah. yet. At this rate, I don't doubt that it would happen this year because I've already done an Indy car race and I've got a NASCAR race coming up, plus my dirt late model stuff. I've done super dirt car series stuff. I mean, you name it. <laughs> it's been awesome, but whole, you're everywhere. I've got it's, stacks of notes. It's awesome. And you, you know, you're right though. It's like, you, I feel like the research comes on race day. You know, when I get to go out announcing, like um, I'm working with the URC this year and I, I feel like that. And even when I was working up at Port Royal, you know, I, I felt like that I got most of my notes that day of the track. Cause you go up, you talk to these guys and you know, you can, you can do all the research you want on the stats and all that, but yet you don't really get the full stories and get to know these guys until you go up there and talk to them a little bit. And then that's what makes the full, I think the, the whole uh, interview process or even the announcing process, I, I feel like that's what makes it better is that when you go get that story and not just have the stats in front of you. Yeah. And I feel like as a pit reporter too, your role is not statistically driven. You know, very rarely are you going to a pit reporter asking them how many top fives they have, what their average finish is, the last three times they've been in Texas, you know, you can have those stats in the back of your brain, to lead into a question or lead into a report. But most of the time, those statistics are something that the booth has already covered. So I feel like stats are so much more on the booth, whereas a pit reporter, your role is to drive the storylines. And so I've always just kind of honed that focus in on is of going and finding, you know, my five, 10 storylines and really just being educated on those more so than statistic. And then of course, as the night progresses, more storylines continue to build themselves, whether it's a guy that you've been told is really good, Rex. There's something that you didn't even have to do research on. You just get to go figure out what happened. So um, I've always definitely enjoyed the pit reporter role because I feel like you're a little bit more submerged in the action compared to, you know, just relaying statistical information. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, we do have a viewer question here. By the way, folks, if you're just joining us, we have Han Newhouse on the Fredericksburg Eagle Hotel hotline. Um, our uh, producer, Chris, he does some hit row TV, and uh, you may know the guy asking this question here. Our buddy Tony asks, he's wondering uh, how much the hit row TV gig helped you land work with NBC and Dirt Vision. So Tony is a saint <laughs> because Tony <laughs> dealt with me when I was, when I was a driver um, in the sense that Tony and I got the introduction when I used to race on the Cars Tour. So he had to come and interview me on pit row. And then... I think the first time I was ever supposed to actually work for Tony, kid you not, he calls me and goes, hey, do you know how to run a switcher? Like, do you know how to run a switchboard? And I was like, absolutely not. And he goes, cool. Well, I need you to meet me at a Starbucks and I'm going to send you to a Legends race down in Georgia and I'm going to teach you how to run the switcher. And so him and I sat in a Starbucks for like two and a half hours and he taught me how to do all the graphics overlays and run the switchboard and all of this stuff. I loaded everything up in my car and was going to leave the next morning. I got 
back home and they canceled the race. And then after that, I was like, Tony, I love you, but I really don't want to do anything unless it's, I love doing RF. I've worked, you know, an RF infield camera for him before. And I, I enjoy that, um, that or on air. And he's been awesome. He calls me when he's got openings and, you know, I always say that this, the more you work, it's just repetition. You know, you don't want to get rusty. And so the more that you can just stay in the motion, he's always great about that. And let me be in the booth, which I thought was super cool. That gave me reps, you know, that I could put on my reel as a booth announcer. Um, and then he was a saint last year when I was supposed to work the full cars tour season with him. And Dirt Vision called me and NBC called me. And I was calling Tony going, so I need these weekends off. I'm really sorry. And Tony was awesome. He was like, nope, I get it. Obviously the goal here is to move people up, you know, um, and that's what's happening. So we're, we're excited for you. So I appreciate it. Now, out of everything that you've done in motorsports from, you know, driving yourself to, to where you are now, what, what has been your favorite thing to do so far? Man, I don't know. You know, I obviously really miss driving, um, but I kind of hit a point where initially I was bitter about not being able to drive because I was seeing kids that I grew up racing with moving up. Like I grew up racing with Noah Gregson and I grew up racing, you know, with all these West Coast kids, Cole Custer, Alex Bowman. Like these are kids that I used to race late models with. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, why am I working three jobs to pay my rent? And these kids are in Xfinity rides. So it was frustrating at first, um, but I do look back on the memories of like racing. I got to race against my dad and my brother at one point. I raced against my dad in super late models, and then I got to race against my brother in pro trucks, which are like 602 like trucks. And uh, man, I never drove so hard in my entire life in those races because I didn't care if I finished DFL. I needed to finish in front of my dad. Or my brother and we had so much fun you know and that's probably one of my favorite memories in that aspect like that I miss the most and is you know what introduced me to this sport and what grew my love for it um but I will say the adrenaline rush that you get in racing while not the same is similar when you're in intense situations as a pit reporter right like you get people that are coming in and you're calling pit stops live during a cup race or you're you know, interviewing someone who's hot-headed after a, after a big wreck, and you just don't know what you're going to walk into. Like, the adrenaline rush is still kind of the same. So I think it's relative in just kind of, like, always going after that excitement factor, um, which keeps me going. And that's also why I think I enjoy different disciplines. You know, if there's an adrenaline rush and in going into a situation, and you, you don't know when you're kind of relying on instinct, hoping the words could come out of your mouth make sense to the thousands of viewers that are listening. So uh yeah i mean i think that's probably it. like the, that's the most thing that i enjoy the most is the adrenaline rush out of both of them now let me ask you this your opinion since you're a pit reporter and i i hate it to do this at port royal but when somebody wrecks especially on the dirt side it's used more on dirt than you do on, on uh on the asphalt side of things like the chili bowl stuff where they go up and interview them right after they wreck i hate that stuff what's your opinion <laughs> on that I, I i know with dylan I back there i'm sure he's not it. a fan of it but i hate it yeah, thank you I'm trying to yeah, get a like, campaign to stop this. I cannot stand it. Like, I remember watching my first Chili Bowl and thinking to myself, if I was that driver, I would either A, end up without a ride because I would MF someone for sticking a microphone in my face, <laughs> or, like, someone would get punched. Like, that is just not okay. And I feel like that's helped me set myself up in certain scenarios, interviewing drivers. Because, you know, more than, more than once I've had a producer in my ear going, go talk to him, go talk to him. And I'm like, listen, I'm going to draw back here on personal experience. I get that you want a, a bite, you know, like a viral bite. But I also have respect for them enough as a human and a racer. Like I wouldn't want a microphone in my space at that point. And I hate that they do it at the chili bowl. And like, that's been one of the apprehensive reasons why I've always been apprehensive about trying to work the chili bowl because I just don't want to be put in that position. Like, I don't want someone telling me, listen, you're either going to walk on the racetrack and interview these guys after they put it in the fence, or you're not going to work. And I'm like, I'm not going to work. Like, that's, that's, that is just something that, like, irks the heck out of me that they do that. And I get it, because, again, it's the entertainment factor versus the, like, 
racer logic factor. So I totally understand what broadcast is doing. I don't think they're in the wrong for it. But as a driver, that just, <clears throat> that would just irritate me. It's the respect factor. Like, that's the main reason, that, like, I hated doing it. Like, I didn't even, I, like, towards the end, I didn't even want to do it because I had too much respect for these guys. And I didn't want to go just shove a microphone in his face after they just slipped their ass off going in turns one and two. Like, no, it's, it, it, they literally, yeah, you'll get a good bite out of it. But I'm not going to, you know, I want it to be a nap thing there. I want to give them a chance to cool down and, you know, maybe get their head together. But, yeah, yeah I don't, I, I hate it. I hate it so much. But, uh, yeah, I, I know we, we're running long on this here. There's so many more questions we can have ask you here, but we got we got to help. I got all the time in the world, so go for it. Fire away, oh, whatever fantastic. you need to do. <laughs> awesome. Uh, anyway, so my next question would be, um, you know, as a woman in motorsports, obviously it, it's been a, a man's sport, but yet there's a lot of good women coming in and taking over. I think in the last decade or two, you know, you've seen a lot of great pit reporters on pit road, like with Foshi, like Chris Lovota come in. Um, now yourself come in with MRN, NBC uh, as well. What's it mean to be a woman in motorsports? And I feel like that the dirt side of things is even more open to women in motorsports, um, especially with, I feel like more women have had more chances on the things. But I mean, in the media side of the world here, it feels like there's a lot of great women as well in motorsports. What's it mean to you be a woman in motorsports, especially at high of a level that you're at right now? Um, I mean, it's pretty cool to, you know, get those experiences to feel like you're kind of trailblazing something, you know what I mean? And I feel like it's nice because I've been on both sides of the bridge where, you know, I was a driver and I was following the path that other females cut for me to be a driver. And as a female, you know, I, how I ended up as a broadcaster is a completely backward story. It was not on purpose. It was actually very accidental. And then it just kept happening again and kept happening again. And I was like, well, they keep hiring me. Maybe I should think about this as a career choice. So, like, it wasn't anything that I ever really, like, looked at and thought to myself originally, you know, that I was looking up, looking up to people like Jamie Little and, and Kelly Stavis, you know. And then, and then I got to know these women, right? And then I realized, you know, what they go through and the challenges that they face in being taken seriously like i feel like i still get it on a regular basis and granted i know not every girl is like this but i you know pride myself on the fact that i know how these cars work you know i've worked on these i've wrenched on these cars i understand how these cars work and it always seems to catch people off guard when i go into an interview or like i'll come you know come flying off the track and i'll you know, ask about the bird cage, or I'll ask about, you know, certain aspects of the car, and they always kind of look at me like, like, did those words just come out of her mouth? Where I, you know, I feel like if it was a guy, they would expect him to know what a bird cage is, and how things work, because otherwise, why are you in this position? So I've always, like, prided myself on keeping up with everything, and learning everything technical, and would hope that, you know, the next girl does the same, but it's so cool and it's funny you say this is a prime example. I flew home from Texas on Sunday from the Indy car race, uh, from working the Indy car race. And Which, by the way, holy shit, sitting... what a finish. Holy shit, what a finish. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Like, would, if you'd have told me on Saturday that that's what the finish was going to be like on Sunday, I'd have told you you were crazy because I had low expectations for that race on Sunday. Yes. Uh, but it was great. Um, but we, we were sitting in the terminal in Dallas, and these two ladies come up to me, and they go, do you work for Dirt Vision? And I was like, what in the world? I look like crap, right? My hair's in a ponytail, hoodies on. I'm just trying to get home at this point. And I was like, yeah, actually I do. And they'd seen my backpack. And both of them were like, oh, you know, my husband watches Dirt Vision. And I've never watched any of the late model races. But now that, like, you know, you're pit reporting, I think it's so cool to see a girl. So we watch a lot of the case late model races. And then, you know, we're, you know, we we follow a lot of your stuff now. And I was like, we just, I, you know, I just got, we got the interest of two other females, whether it's fans or people that aspire to work in the sport simply because they see themselves on TV. And uh, that's wild to me because I've always just eat, sleep and breathe the motorsports. I didn't care who was on TV. I was going to try and get there, but to see what the outreach and how it's affected other people and how people tell me that it's affected them. I'm like, this is so cool, and it kind of makes me just want to strive for more, you know, to have that presence now in sports car racing or to have that presence in the dirt light model world or, 
you know, whatever my next endeavor is, um, to know that whether it's someone's wife, girlfriend, daughter in the grandstands, you know, on pit road sees a girl and they're like, Oh, girls can do that. Um, and then that, you know, opens up whether or not even a motorsport, it's just kind of that in- idea that they can do anything they want. So I always think that's probably sounds cliche, but you get the point. <laughs> mm, absolutely. Absolutely. But like the fact that you understand how a lot of these cars work and you, you take the time to research on how they work and you like, you can actually talk to a driver about, you know, what the car is doing compared to not being able to like that, that really sets you apart from a lot of the other people. And not just females in motorsports. I mean, I've talked to plenty of guys in the motorsports side of things that can look at a race car and not even tell you how the left, how much air should be in the left rear tire. You know what I mean? Like there's, there's just, there's something about the fact that you take the time to know what you're talking about, let alone just, oh yeah, you know, it looks like it has a flat right rear. Well, anyone can determine that it has a flat right rear when it's flat. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of dumb people in motorsports, like not dumb in the aspect that they're dumb, but in the aspect that they don't take the time to learn things. You know what I mean? But aside from that, what you've gone to, gosh, I'm sure thousands of racetracks and well, not thousands, but hundreds of racetracks and thousands of different types of events. What has been your most favorite so far, whether it be the late model side or like what, what race really sticks out to you with like, man, I can't wait to get back to that. Cause it gives me goosebumps type of thing. So I'm going to get it so tough. I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep it short, but I'm going to kind of hit one in each discipline because I feel like it's not even fair to okay. compare any of them. Chili bowl, hands down. If no one's ever been to chili bowl, you got to go for the experience because it is the racing. Some nights is subpar. But man, the experience of Chili Bowl and having 400 cars in an expo center and race all night long is incredible. So Chili Bowl is definitely one. It's never disappoints. Um, Prairie Dirt Classic. Everyone, I knew what that race was before I'd even seen a dirt late model race because I just, you just, it's just one of those races. Um, Prairie Dirt Classic was so cool to experience to ride around town on the golf cart. You know, they shut that town down. You go to the diners, there's yard sales, people are camping on the baseball diamond. Like it was just was such a cool event. So PDC, uh, the Indy 500 is incredible. Nothing matches it. Being on, you know, the front stretch pit road during opening ceremonies, wild. Like it takes a lot to give me goosebumps anymore. And that was absolutely incredible. And then in pavement late model racing, I'm gonna go the snowball derby. And not even the race itself, but qualifying night of the Snowball Derby is probably one of the most intense things I've ever been involved in, in watching 60 guys try and qualify for, like, less than 20 spots, and everyone's within less than a tenth of a second. I mean, it is it is intense on pit road. So that was that was a long way of answering your question, but there was, like, four that I just <laughs> – those are my four. <laughs> I must say, you know, and you got to go to the Knoxville Nationals. If you haven't been, oh, I still haven't been to the nationals. You oh. gotta. It's. I feel it's like wild. the way you describe Prairie Dirt is kind of like Knoxville. Knoxville, yeah, like that whole. Yeah, the only time. Really... I'm trying to think. The only time I've been to Knoxville. Was, we worked a truck race or an Xfinity race or something somewhere around the vicinity, and we were like, oh. Probably we'll drive down there and so I went and watched a local yeah I went and watched a local 360 show and you know of course we like walked over to Dingus but it was a regular again local show so Dingus was dead but like all of my friends that go to national you know Knoxville Nationals even Dylan Dylan's like it's just it's an experience like you just plan on dying at Dingus every night and you walk back <laughs> to probably the days in or whatever it is and you know everyone just recoups and does it again the next day like that's just how Nationals works yeah. yeah. Oh, Adam that, and I learned the hard way this last year. That's yeah. <laughs> that's definitely the summary of it. You know, you you drink until you can't drink anymore. You crawl or stumble back to wherever you're staying and wake up a couple hours later and attempt to to do it all over again. It's just Hair of the dog there's it, something yeah. about how yeah, like yeah. It, there's just something about how uh, like you're just driving through, and it really I guess it all starts with uh slide TJ sideways, 
Like once you see that, you know you're getting close. And then like mm -hmm. you just start seeing campers everywhere and race car trailers and like the whole town's just completely shut Amazing. down. Like Yeah, that's incredible. It, it that's is. definitely like Dylan's coming to Prairie Dirt Classic with me this year. He works the truck race at IRP and then he's gonna drive down. And uh I'm excited for him to get to experience that. And I gotta what weekend is Knoxville Nationals? That is, you know, top of our head. Uh, I think it's the 12th yeah. to 15th, something like that. Just a second here. We have technology. Uh, it is. By the way, you were saying about you go to die at Dingus. If you don't die at Dingus, you go die in turn three and four with the size bar and grill. I'm sure you've heard of that before. Ah, uh, yes. You know, it's, it's, oh, is it the 10th God, to the 13th? I, I believe so. it is. Yes, 10th uh, to yes, 13th. it is August 10th to the 13th. That's what I thought. So, oh, the week after would be the Jackson well, Nationals, uh, not. I am off that weekend, friends. Oh, Lordy, Anna. It's NASCAR Richmond weekend, and I'm not working it. And I, there's no late model Anna, races or anything. This, so, this sounds like Chuck Norris is at the Dingus. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this sounds like. This sounds like Chuck Norris is at the Dingus. I'm going to find out if Dylan's I, working Richmond now and be like, hey, so now we're not going on a honeymoon. We, Should we take an early one and go to Knoxville? <laughs> Sold. Can we go to the Nationals? I mean, yeah, it sounds like Cancun or whatever, Hawaii. Do. I'm going to go to Iowa, the yeah. middle of Iowa. Yeah, Knoxville, <laughs> Iowa. Because, I mean, some would say Knoxville, Iowa in the middle of August might be hotter than Cancun. You know, I don't know. This is true. I'll probably drink just as much and get a tan. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. You want to know the best, the best <laughs> drunk food though I found out there? Only in Iowa would corn on the cob on a stick be considered drunk food. I tell you what, it was the best drunk food I, I ever had. I love corn on the cob, so I'm sure it's even better drunk, so. Oh, it was fantastic drunk. And they dip, they dip that rib shit shack. in a pot of butter. Rib shack. Ooh, yeah, that's a good yes, one. Yes, rib a, shack. That's thank a good you one later. Hangover. Or that's Mr. C's. Mr. C's was good for breakfast. You guys sound like seasoned yeah, veterans C's. at this. We and only you know went what? once. Only first, last year was our first year. Oh. Last year. And, and we, we crammed everything we... in. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's That's too funny. It's awesome. By the way, you brought the Snowball Derby. I feel like with the Snowball Derby, you're better off staying for the tech afterwards with that shit show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's definitely been rough the last couple of years. Like, as a pavement fan, it's so hard for me to, like make a case right like i've been i went to the snowball derby five years ago like and then the three years prior and i haven't been back since just because of how my schedule pans out but yeah it's awfully hard to make a case uh to tell people to go when they spend three hours in the tech shed and tearing stuff down like i get it because it's the biggest race of the year but like mm -hmm. it sure doesn't pay like the biggest race of the year first and foremost no. so it'd be like tearing people's engines down for like one of the smaller paying big super late model races i don't know i just feel like there's some part of the allure that's been lost in in going to the derby because of that but also i see the other side of it where they're like oh well if you're gonna win it you're gonna win it fair and square and we're gonna completely mm -hmm. strip search your car so i get that but like i don't know like i just don't i don't know how you come to a middle ground because racers are going to push the envelope, right? If they hear you're not going to tech, if they hear you're not going to tech wheel weights one year, they're going to jack with their wheel weights. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, one year they had to outlaw swing weights in the back, like part of the chassis, like the frame railing. And so someone tried to run swing weights and they got caught after qualifying with it. Like, drivers are always going to push the envelope, but at what point do you oh, yeah. just, if, I don't know. If there's a gray area in the notebook, they're going to play the in it. Book, Oh, yeah. They're gonna play in it until someone says otherwise. Mm -hmm. It's racing. It's racing. They're always yeah. gonna play with that. And if you're but I, I, if you're a driver and you're not pushing the gray envelope, what are we doing, doing right. here? Yeah. yeah, I mean everyone's guilty of it. Literally everyone from I'm, I'm someone totally racing a go kart. Here. <laughs> yeah, we we uh, we used to, in our pro trucks. We used to have a rule that said. <laughs> that said non-rebuildable shocks right so everything was mm -hmm. super conventional on all of our cars like we had very straightforward rules and the reason they were that way is because they were budget friendly 
So like we didn't want people going out and like spending a ton of money on like suspension and whatever. Like we wanted it to be very budget friendly for someone that's looking to move up from straight stocks or something like that in, into a late model truck. So we had the rule of non-rebuildable shocks so people wouldn't go dump a bunch of money in shocks. So what did we do? We went and had shocks built, but we had them sealed. So therefore they're non-rebuildable oh. shocks. Well, that okay. then rule had to be changed halfway through the season that it is stock shocks, no custom built shocks. Here's the vendor. Here's who you can buy through. And <laughs> here's the five different kinds of shocks that you can buy. CC Hannah Newhouse in the rule. <laughs> <laughs> so That's again, funny. that gray area just makes me laugh. because It's like, you're not, they're not going to read it for what it is. They're going to figure yeah, out ways around I mean, it. Like and everyone's guilty of it from running go-karts all the way up to nascar if if you're not pushing the gray envelope in the gray area you're you're not trying hard enough yeah why do you think all the guys that win the race usually fail tech and start at the back like yeah. they'll go ahead and jack with something else on the car right like they'll jack with like like the like the flange and how it you know when they go through tech it's out an eighth of an inch and then they're like oh man you failed on that eighth of an inch, but little do they know that they've got some sort of compression system in the brakes yeah. that was completely overlooked mm -hmm. because they were so worried about the eighth of an inch that they knew was going to get caught. So they sent them to the back and they've got a competitive yeah. advantage because no one ever checked the compression system. Like there's just, it just makes me laugh because it's like, there's, there's totally a logic behind it and strategy. Like I always say that race car drivers are the smartest cheaters ever. Yes. Oh yeah. 100%. I mean, like, and like they'll just overlook it too like oh i failed tech three times but on that fourth time they didn't catch me mm -hmm. <laughs> yep i just yep. have to start in the rear now yeah and in, in a 400 lap race man you can do anything yeah. yeah and you know what and they're not stupid they know what they're doing in that in that they, yeah and like oh, yeah. They, you say the racers but yet the crew members they're probably smarter than all they know what's going on in that in the garage and all that shit when they go through don't, the, don't you look at me phoenix don't or you look at me Bert. i have i know nothing i see nothing uh, yeah he's a yeah uh, boy. i don't know what you're oh, talking that. about anyway oh, yeah i don't know what you're talking about get, here adam get out of here <laughs> anyway uh yeah we really we need to wrap this up chris is yelling in my ear here we need to wrap this up but hannah this has been fantastic by the way i I got a I got a Snapchat from somebody here when I said that we're interviewing tonight. Uh, who's your favorite dirt racing photographer? JC Norgard. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's that all they wanted JC? me to ask. You. <laughs> that was all JC wanted me to ask. You. Who's your favorite dirt racing? Photographer? I love it. Oh, he, JC was definitely trying JC to set you up on that one. He was. Oh yeah. Luckily that's for him, he's also the only dirt photographer that I know. <laughs> oh okay. Well. You got two more here, so you got you know you know three. There you so, go, Hannah. I love this it. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much for the time on this. Uh, where can everyone go see? Uh, yeah, uh, the World of Outlaw Case Late Mall Series. Where are they at the next couple of weeks? And of course, you got to plug Dirt Vision. Everything you're doing as well. Yeah, I know it's a busy next couple of weeks. Like you said, uh, we go to Lakeview on Thursday with Extreme. Two nights of Case at Cherokee. And then we're at Farmer City next weekend, I believe, is where we are. Um, I mean, I gotta actually look at the schedule. But yeah, I think we're at Farmer City the next couple weekends. And then, man, it gets full swing for me. You know, I'll be at Bristol Dirt Races for NASCAR as well as, you know, Dirt or Dirt Vision. I've got a couple NBC races at Lime Rock and Watkins Glen um, with INSA. I'm working Indy GP for Indy Lights. So, you just never know where you're going to turn on your TV and see good old Hannah Newhouse pop up. But, you know, I'm definitely excited to be on the beat with, you know, the case light models because it is a super fun tour to follow. And we go to some really cool places. We go to some questionable places, but we also go to some really cool places. Uh, so I'm excited to, you know, really get to take that in this year. You know, and I think one of those questionable places is Pennsylvania because us who know heads will come say hi to you. How about that? Perfect. No, I'm looking forward to it. We only have a couple Pennsylvania races this year. We only have, I, I know. think. Is it Port Royal and Sons Grove? Port Royal and Sons Grove, Williams And then there's one more. The Grove, I, the Grove. I think there's yeah, we're the Grove, too. We're, yeah, and then we go to Thunder Mountain. Is that in PA? That's that's Western PA. That don't count. Okay, because we don't go to Erie's, <laughs> and we don't go to... Learnerville. There's one more we'll that we don't go to. Anymore. Either way. Yeah, so... Oh, yeah, we don't so go to uh, Grove, Port. 
yeah, there's Erie's and then what's the one near Bear Lake? Uh, I think that's Thunder Mountain. There's one that like Chubb's family like is involved with. I can't think of what it is. Or, oh, oh, State Line. Is that State Line? State Line. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There it is. State we line. don't go to State Line either. That, that's Western Northern PA. That's based in New York. That don't count. It's either Port Royal, Williams Grove, uh, Lincoln, Seals Grove, or get the hell out. That's Yo, I would count. love yeah, to see a, to, a, a super late model race Port. at Lincoln. Like, yeah. Lucky. I would Listen, kill to see that. 2020, when they came, 2020 game, it was badass. I wish it would yeah. come back really? to Lincoln. Oh my God, it was so badass. I mean, Shepard won, obviously, but it was still so badass to see, you know, something different in Lincoln. You know, we're so used to the 410s down there. It's great. It was great to see the late models down there. I wish they would do more. So hopefully, y'all get back to Lincoln. But Anna, thank you so much for the time. This has been awesome. We we were going to have to have you back on again because we have so much more to talk about. Apparently. Yeah, no, please let me know. Like uh, I said, I mean, usually weekdays, I'm I'm relatively available. So I appreciate you guys being flexible with my crazy schedule. <laughs> hey, we, oh, absolutely. we appreciate you. Give us the time here. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon here. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I'm Ryan Newman. And since I started with Indiana Donor Network and Driven to Save Lives, I found out that some people think that they can't be an organ donor. The truth is, anyone can sign up to be an organ donor. Anyone? Anyone? Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Anyone can sign up to be an organ donor. So don't count yourself out because somebody's counting on you. Go to driventosavelives.org and sign up today. But my heart's going to you, right? Love that shirt. Welcome to the 34 Motorsports Product Showcase. We're proud to offer the full line of Simpson Racing safety products. The Shark Speedway is a perfect brain bucket to keep your melon as safe as possible. We carry every model and size of Hans device, and these have saved countless lives. The Hybrid Pro Lite is an alternative to the Hans device and is just as effective. The DNA three-layer suit offers maximum protection when things get hot. And hey, dude, those comfy shoes won't help one bit when things go south. Keep those hands ready to work with a pair of Vortex FIA gloves meeting every current standard. From five to seven points, we carry every one of the Simpson harnesses, keeping your rear end right where it should be. Keep all your gear clean and together with the helmet and FHR bag and always be ready to hop in a race car. Visit 34motorsports.com and order today. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the High Side Hustle right here on the National Race Network. Bert Wojcik, Adam Rubright, we're back with you live now. Uh, what an interview with Hannah. Thank you so much, Hannah Newhouse, for coming on board and uh, giving us a little bit of your time here. Uh, absolutely tremendous. Uh, talk a lot, a lot about the World of Outlaw Case Late Model Series. Also, uh, Dryden Extreme Series. Actually, no, it's not the Extreme Series. Uh, I don't even think Dryden's a part of that anymore, but whatever. It's still the Extreme Series are down at the uh, – um, oh, I forget where the hell they're at this tomorrow – tonight, actually. But I probably, they probably got rained out anyways. Uh, but tomorrow oh, night, yeah. uh, right. back to Cherokee. Um, back to um, Cherokee on Saturday as well. Uh, Russ, maybe. We'll see what the weather's like uh, on – Saturday now that uh, of course Mother Nature has decided to cancel a lot of stuff already on Saturday and uh we'll go into that real quick before we get into our weekend recap here. Uh hopefully we'll have we'll have Ryan go in just a few minutes. But uh Adam, 
Um, Finch's new, meat markets news and knows what do you have in there so far, bud? All right, so far for the week, we have Weather Stops Atomic Super Dirt Car Series run, which is unfortunate because I was really watch- looking forward to tuning into that on television. Um, naturally, like ev- everywhere else on the east coast or in the middle part of the country, dealing with unstable weather conditions, rain, snow, and blue, below freezing temperatures. So, not really much you can do there. It's nice of them nope. to cancel instead of having. A lot of them guys come from upstate New York all the way out to Ohio to, you know, for a rain out or a snow out or whatever. Worse, no one even show the heck up. Yeah, <laughs> that's what that's what I think. Uh, Bridgeport pulled the plug. So, uh, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, why, and um, you can't you can't blame them. Bridgeport pulled the plug for both weekend. No, I can't. I, I'm did though. I was really, I was so geared up for this weekend. So geared up for Bridgeport, ready to. You'd be up in the booth of Barry and Jeff, and you know we'll just have to uh, go back at it. I guess if we're at URC. We're back at it April 9th up at Port Royal. Uh, that'll be fun. I'll let y'all put two. Speaking of Port Royal, yes, um, they moved their start times up for two for by two hours to combat oh, still, this weekend's mm-hmm. weather. Still gonna be iffy, but while we're also on the subject of Port Royal. Um, I'm sure everyone saw the on track festivities last right, weekend. Let's get into it. No, 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 no. We're not going to fully break into it. Uh, everyone saw it. We don't need to relive it. Like shit happens. Drivers got their internal temperatures flared up a little bit. Um, but good on these two. Um, both Logan and Anthony are going to be donating portions of their merchandise sales from this weekend to benefit a two-year-old little girl who was diagnosed with leukemia. So yes. good on them for not necessarily putting their differences aside, but putting their differences aside to help out somebody in need. And that's one thing that I truly love about the sport that we are so involved in. Yes, I agree. I, I think it's one of the best things about it. Um, and I'm glad that they're using their outreach for good like this, but Here's my question. Do we have a rivalry or is it still in just two drivers getting heated? Uh, I guess we'll see how that plays out this season the rest of the way. I mean, it's not like a until... it's not like a Brad Sweet, Donnie Shots rivalry just quite yet. Or like how a Steve Kinzer, Sammy Swindell rivalry. rivalry. Uh, I don't know. That's... All depends on what... how heated it gets. Yeah, and I, I, I like I've always wondered that. Like, what's it a rivalry? I mean, honestly, yeah, you know, you look at Swindell and Kenzo. You know, obviously some of the bad mouthing and all all that shit that went on back in the nineties. And you know, you you look at you know the last I don't know maybe ten years. I think maybe the only rivalry that maybe the fans have started was Monteith and Dietrich. Other than that, what a rivalry do you have? I mean, driver wise, recently, no, I mean, nothing really that I can think of on the dirt side of things. I mean, mm-hmm. plenty of rivalries on the NASCAR side of things, but. Yep. I don't know. I mean, call it what you will. I think it was just, you know, Logan clearly aggravated. You know, he wasn't having the necessarily afternoon that he was hoping for and remember shit happens. Was third when that happened he was running third yeah I think. yeah i mean shit shit happens mm-hmm. i mean and could they have both given the spot yeah could that have been avoided yeah could we have finished the race no issues absolutely but it, mm-hmm. you know it, it is what it is but moving on before we get uh ryan in here um my biggest takeaway of the week so far NASCAR wise was <laughs> this brouhaha of a penalty that just got cracked down on uh, Roush Fenway Kozlowski Racing. Um, the number six car of Roush Fenway Racing, Roush Fenway Kozlowski Racing, God, that's so weird to say. It is. Uh, I is hate it. Getting docked 100 driver and 100 owner points to impact both teams pass to the, or impact the team's path to the postseason, which could be significant given how the new series or the system works. Penalty is under sections 4. 14.1 and 14.5 in the NASCAR rulebook, 
both of which pertain to the modification of a single source supplied part. Crew chief was also fined $100,000 and suspended for the next four NASCAR points races. So it it doesn't sound to be body related. So it's definitely something internal. And remember, they were one of those teams that got their wheels taken away at Daytona. So obviously they're touching something that they shouldn't be. Now, here's the thing too. I don't know. I just don't feel like Kazalowski and Roush are going to make the playoffs this year. I don't think they're going to. I, I just think they're. I mean, that was already predicted at the beginning of the season that Brad even said it himself. It's going to take time to get this thing rolling. Now, granted, the car is right. rolling pretty good right now, but it's clear that they were pushing the, as we were talking to Hannah about, the gray area. Mm-hmm. It seems like they pushed the gray area and they found the exact limit as to where it can go and yep. a pretty hefty fine and some penalties. So, yeah. Chris, yeah. I'd love to get I, your I thoughts on that... this whole debacle. Yeah. Come on in, producer man. Did you fall asleep again? Or not. Right that on. works too. Pickle just go. Pickle just go. I had to find the right button. Sorry, boys. Ah, <laughs> there, there he is. Our executive producer, Chris Graham. Welcome to the uh, As Bert mentioned on the penalties here, it's it's not body related because that was added to the new composite bodies were added to the holy trinity of engine, fuel, and tires. Screw with them and you're going to meet the holy trinity. The the composite bodies have multiple layers of markings like baked into them. They can tell if you sand a body part, you cannot touch them. So I don't think that's what they did, but there are now quite literally hundreds of single source parts on these new cars. That's part of the reason that they've been having issues with getting spares built and backup cars built is because they're single sourcing parts. So it'll be interesting to hear what the team has to say on the penalty. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if they even, I don't know that they're going to disclose what part they (coughs) messed with. (coughs) If I'm NASCAR, I'm not disclosing it. It tells the teams, here's what we're checking. And if you're Keselowski, you're not telling because you obviously found something. You think yeah. you thought you found a gray area to play in. Well, it's not a gray area. Definitely not. It's gonna cost no. you some cost yeah, you a little bit. By the way, what'd you think of Atlanta yeah. on Sunday? I I, I I don't know. I'm I'm I feel weird about it. I didn't catch any of it. I was actually watching Port Royal. Yeah. Uh oh. I was back and forth. I thought I Atlanta know, I was fun. About it's just I don't know. It's just so different seeing like drafting and all that on a mile and a half. It just seems. Weird. But wasn't that what they were going for when they repaved it? That I is exactly so. right. They were shooting for so. big time mile, a long racing half. and and wildness at a mile and a half. Yeah, I don't want to see them do this to every racetrack though, no. because no, no, you couldn't because you. you you took away, you took away those nasty you know bumps and bumps and spits and turns you throughout took the away track. probably the best track in NASCAR I think just the 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 characteristics of it um yes were what yes, made the race the cool. problem is it needed it mm-hmm. like oh it yeah it, it needed to be yeah because if I'm right that was the original surface for when they reconfigured a land in '97 from the old uh basically I, I, typical oval. Correct. To what it turned into. That was their first pave since 97. Correct. That was the, so the you're still ta- the surface that Jeff Bodine went 197 miles an hour average in qualifying on. That's insane. Yeah. That, and they think about it. They were still doing speeds like that, too. And that old surface. They weren't that far. I don't think they were doing 197 in qualifying. 
but they were still reaching over 200 going in turn one and turn three at Atlanta on that old turf. Oh, yeah. That's impressive, you know, with the, like, whoop section they had going on there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it sucks I, to I, get the rid of the character, like, the old school characteristics of that racetrack, but in the same aspect, it's nice to see an ownership group actually doing something to improve the facility. Right. I'm curious to see what they're going to do uh, well, with it. Well, hold up here. Oh, boy. That, that's the same Speedway Motorsports that Diamond Ground Bristol progressively uh, banked Bristol, put PJ1 down everywhere at Texas, reconfigured Texas. <coughs> SMI is a, well, quite frankly, they have a handful of not good decisions on their resume of recent. Yeah, uh, the, the, they definitely have some not great ideas that they manufactured in this and interesting shenanigans but uh, yeah, i don't know i'd like the the repavement of of atlanta yeah it sucks like i said you got rid of the the old school characteristics of it but it long term i think it should make the racing better i think it's going to just take a little bit of adjustment for it honestly um you know once people don't like change fills in that's that and like that's the thing i was i wasn't expecting the drafting like i, I didn't read in too much I'll, I'll i'll be first admit i didn't read too much into what atlanta was supposed to be um but I was more looking forward to like the typical Atlanta race, you know, see what these cars actually can do in a mile and a half. So my next question is, which I guess Charlotte, that'd be the kind of first real test on a mile and a half type. Because we're going to get a good, I think we're, they're going to get a good test this week at Coda. I'm looking forward to Coda on Sunday. Oh, yeah. I, I will I will sit down and watch Coda. Um, speaking of Texas, and I said Texas sucks, which it does for NASCAR. Holy shit, that any car finish. Holy shit, Chris. Adam, I, I'm sure, I don't know if you caught that or not, but that IndyCar finish? Ooh, boy. Texas what a... forever. Damn. Watch God. the race back. Adam, quit being Go a on. communist. Seriously. Whoa. Watch the IndyCar race Whoa. back. Whoa. Go that was I watched... Kyle Kirkwood passed 10 cars in the PJ1. The crap they said you mm-hmm. couldn't drive in? Kyle Kirkwood passed 10 cars on a restart in it. It was. The kid was a show. And he's driving for AJ Foy, right? Yes. So that, that's, that, that's big text right there. He that's should have text. been in the car that Devlin DeFrancesco was in for Andretti. DeFrancesco mm-hmm. caused three separate wrecks and had a god awful day. And the guy who could have been in the car was doing incredible things in aj foyt junk yeah i'll give you your show back it was it was a one by the way i know nbc said it so much by the way joseph newgarden was a winner of that at uh texas in over uh scott mclaughlin in a fantastic finish in the pj1 nonetheless too i will say that um yeah uh that was fun to watch uh jimmy johnson top 10 first indycar oval start Good on Jimmy. Uh, his NBC didn't say that enough. God, I hate it. I hate NBC when they were in Jimmy Johnson era and all that shit. God, I couldn't stand it, but they were all up Jimmy Johnson again. But good on Jimmy. Takes takes a lot to do that shit. I agree. Uh, so what else do we have here from this weekend? Uh, F1 was good. Uh, new car ran very well, I thought. Um, Formula Un on sunday morning that was fun to watch uh good on ferrari uh we were talking a little about that uh possibly ferrari win in italy this year that could be they might burn down the entire boot of italy so uh all right so let's get into what we saw over the weekend here uh friday night williams grove um uh, justin peck go out there get the win i was not expecting justin peck but that's gonna i wasn't a, expecting A-OK. any of it any of it the racing throughout the field was on point. Marx was mm-hmm. what, like 19th up into and in, in, well inside the top 10. Before Lance dropped out, he was 16th to fuck 7th or better. Yep. Dylan Norris put on a heck of a charge from deeper in the field to finish what, 4th or 5th? Like, yep. kudos. Like, for how the weather was that, that day, you know, it was kind of windy, a little cold, a little chilly. The sun was out, but it really wasn't all the way out. 
Like I think they it got and... chilly at Friday night. Friday was beautiful. Yeah, 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 yeah. But for how the weather was with the wind and all that stuff, I think they did an exceptional job with that racetrack. They... And I can't, I can't say it enough. That was the first time what? in God a long time that I've seen not just one or two cars being able to move forward throughout the feature, but anyone who was had the capability of driving forward went forward. What did I say on this show on Thursday night? I said there was no excuse for the Grove not to put out their best track on Friday night with the way Friday you had you didn't have much rain on Thursday. You had you had a be- you had two gorgeous days. You had a beautiful day on Thursday. You had a beautiful day on Friday. No reason the Grove should have not been perfect, and they knocked it out of the goddamn ballpark. Hat off to everyone at the Grove. What a show! And you got it in before the little rain shower. I didn't even know was going to be coming. Came in, so you got your four tens and late models. I think that was a shit show in itself. Late models. I, I I don't know what was going on with them, but Greg Saturday picked up the win on that in a shortened feature. But the four tens, you're right, Adam. There was so much passing. Mark Smith probably would have won that feature if he didn't break. Pat Cannon, he where did he find his speed? He was up front all night long. Um, Lucas Wolf, he didn't look terrible at all. You know. The girls could be fun this year. If they give us a service like that every week. Now, tomorrow night, I don't know what to expect. I feel like tomorrow night's going to be pretty cold. And so I imagine probably a fast choo-choo train tomorrow night. But that's weather for you, especially if we're going to get some of this uh, rain to talk about overnight. But I feel like that it is going to be a uh, – I feel like tomorrow night is probably not going to be as good as Friday night. But once again, if we can get that service to grow most of the year, wrong. Prove us wrong. Exactly. Prove us wrong. But, so good old Williams Grove. <clears throat> like we've all then, heard the, uh, the the stereotypes of how Williams Grove has been. Mm-hmm. Last week was fantastic. I, I really hope That's that fair. they keep that trend going in the right direction. But <clears throat> we all know how it's gonna get in the summer. You know, hot and heavy. Like is like as as the there's nothing enough. around that. Yeah. That's, like you're not going to get thing. away from every once in a while having an absolute snooze fest, but right, you know, if you can get three out of the four races a month with a good racetrack and cars willing to pass and have two two and a half lanes of racing, awesome. Yeah, I will take I will take that surface at the Grove every Friday night if we can get that. You know, Mother Nature's got to play nice, but. Mother Nature wasn't playing nice on Saturday as Port pulled the plug. Um, who else pulled the plug? Uh, Stealings Grove. Stealings Grove pulled the plug, unfortunately, which good call there because that storm, when it came through, was nasty. But Lincoln did not pull the plug, and they went on and raced. And our boy Brent Marks goes out, gets the win on Saturday night down the Pigeon Hills. And uh, Brent. Him and Fudd, they had a they actually I think Brent came from what I think six, and uh, good run on him. Had a very uh, a very racy track for Lincoln, on a very yeah. uh, how do I want to say it juice up track. Well, it it definitely could have been super heavy and not able to pass on, but it so was good. They got and they got a lot of rain. They got a good bit of rain down there, and they still yeah. got a good track. It was fantastic. It was absolutely uh, just a good race. So we'll finish up the rest of the weekend, which actually we will talk about this after this man's in here. Ladies and gentlemen, he just joined us here. He has he made a little bit of money in the last month or so here to start out the year. Uh, Some would he, say. Yeah, a little bit. So just, you know, a $25,000 payday at Cherokee, 5000 this past weekend at Fort Royal. Sports product. As Chris hits the, he did Chris did this last week. He got the wrong ear end of the show. This, but ladies and gentlemen, join us on the Frenchburg Eagle Hotel. The Ringo's Rocket Ryan Go Down. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on, man. Ah, no problem, man. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Uh, so you made a little bit of money so far this year, just just a little bit. I I'd say thirty grand in the first month. You know, that's that's okay. That's okay to start the year. A good jump start. Good jump start. <laughs> About it, man. Hey, congratulations on a win on uh, Sunday at Port Royal. You and Mike put on a hell of a show, and I mean this the nicest way possible. If Stu doesn't break, 
I don't think either of you guys win that race. But what a show you and Mike put on the last closing laps of that race when everyone's tires are going to shit and whatever, but you you guys somehow hold on your tires and put on an excellent couple last laps. Yeah, no, it was fun. Actually, the race changed quite a bit. I, we were pretty good in the beginning, and I kind of just wanted to baby my tires. So I really wasn't even showing in the beginning what we had. And even when I got the lead, I kind of was just buying my time, buying my time. Really till about them them series of caution flags, like, well, five to go. Then I really had to try to step it up a little bit just because I know how that tire wear is there. And, you know, I just didn't want to burn my stuff up too quick. Yeah, absolutely. And got tires up there. So damn important. But were you on a, on a block, a big block, or just a regular spec head for that? No, we had a big block. So our... 440 car open small block car we ran a cherokee we parked that for middletown and we wanted to run a big block because we ran a big block there in the fall it was pretty successful just at the end we kind of ran out of tires so we were like we we know we can get through this race with a big block and not be too hard on it we got a lot bigger shows throughout the year so we're trying to conserve laps where we can on certain motors just so we have everything for all year you know yeah, and how much have you guys had to kind of hold back on stuff right now? Obviously, I've heard stuff on the modified side of things. It, it is hard everywhere. It's hard to get parts on. How much have you guys held back a little bit on stuff just to kind of, as you said, obviously, you're you're doing that with your uh, car for um, Orange County. But have you had to hold back a little bit like towards it last year as well? Or are, are you guys expecting it maybe to get a little bit better as the year goes on as well? Well, you never know how this year is going to go, but I mean, we're trying to be conservative early. Then, you know, when it gets to, toward the end of the year, then obviously all the gloves are off. You're going to do what you can to, uh, you know, get where you have to be. But, you know, problem is something happens to the motor. It's just hard getting parts right now. So we have good pieces and everything we have. But if one of them pieces breaks, then the puzzle starts falling apart a little bit. We have backups, but backups are some of them aren't as good as the others. So, you, know, you just got to plan ahead and try to be smart where the racetracks you can be smart on and, and some of the stuff to conserve and try to conserve that way. Yeah, definitely. And I've, I've often wondered this since you started this whole new team. What, last year? Start of last year, I believe yeah. it was. Why the choice to kind of run your own equipment versus running for someone else? Was it more of you know, just kind of being able to have the freedom to pick and choose where you want to race or when and where you wanted to go, or did you have, you know, a bigger majority of sponsorship kind of lead into that or? Well, there was a lot of things that led into it. You know, some deals just didn't transpire the way we wanted to. And then you look at who's successful, right? You see a guy like Matt Shepard successful in his own stuff and, you know, it's his own team. He gets the sponsors and, Builds it from the ground up. Um, so, you know, that's kind of what we've always done a career. We've always done good. Um, shop with our own equipment, with our own guys. Not saying we could do anything better with somebody else, but it just it makes life a lot easier. It makes me able to get home, home to my family a lot easier. It makes every night in the shop a little closer to home. Absolutely. And it, proven success last year with uh bridgeport bridgeport track champion and I, i'm already i'm already disappointed because i was looking forward to that this weekend uh the new configuration of bridgeport obviously you're a fan of it you've been so successful down there even on the old configuration you were good there i i, I think that what doug and them had done with bridgeport I, I, he saved it. i mean obviously we all love the 5.8 the pimp love the 5.8 but you know what this new configuration it, it's it's better racing i i feel that the 5.8 didn't put on good racing but this new configuration of bridgeport this is pretty badass ain't it Oh, you ain't, there's not a racetrack out there. You know, you look at every, I think Port Royal is the next one closest to it. If you had to guess, I mean, there's other racetrack produce great racing, but mm -hmm. not like Bridgeport. I mean, Bridgeport's his own unique and he's got a lot of good things to come throughout the years. I mean, the races that we've run there and done well. And then I watch like even a sportsman race or a, a street stock race or a sprint car race or a wingless race. I mean, there's never a bad race there. And that's, all you can ask for as a race fan going there to watch. Um, it's just pretty neat to be a part of it. And it almost like in New Jersey here, it brought the racing back to New Jersey where it kind of got held there for a few years um, with the two tracks. So now it just jump started everything and 
you know, hopefully New Egypt follows it. And we got two racetracks in New Jersey to, to uh, be great, but uh, it's just fun to be a part of. Definitely. And you hit on New Egypt there and obviously you have your big two tracks up here in, in Pennsylvania, but out of the four of them, which, which one kind of plays into your, your driving style more? I mean, obviously you're quite fond of Bridgeport, the new configuration here, but you know, in, in when it comes to Pennsylvania, which track do you feel more comfortable racing at? Like a big diamond Grandview or like a port? Royal? Yeah, uh, I, well, I guess your weekly shows, your your big diamond or your grand views. Well, I mean, we've had, I mean, you look at the wins we've had at, at big diamond, probably wins at big diamond and grand view. Grand view, you have to have patience there. And I think finally I'm, uh, you know, getting old now. I'm like growing patience at grand view where, you know, 10 <laughs> years of patience, we knocked the front end off every other week. But, uh, you know, that place is a very unique place. You have to have patience, but you have got to be aggressive when you can. And that's why I think it makes Craig Von Dorn, Jeff Strunk, Dwayne Howard as good as they are there, because they're they've been they grew up there. Let's be honest. I mean, really, there hasn't been anybody there um, consistently as much as winning as they have been. You know. Yeah, you're you're right. And but you know what you, you said about your patience, and that paid off big time last year at the Freedom Seventy Six. I know we were going to try and have you on after the Sixer last year, and it didn't uh, the schedule didn't work out there, but. You know, that's a massive win for your career, I feel like. You know, for as long as you've been doing this, I mean, everyone wants to, in the Northeast wants to win that Freedom 76. What did that mean to you last year to go get the Sixer? And, you know, especially at a place at Granby where, obviously, you know, you haven't had the success as, say, like Big Diamond or Bridgeport or New Egypt. But still, I mean, Grandview, that Freedom 76, I mean, that had to be a massive, massive weight off your chest to go get that big, that big time check there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you look at, you know, the Cole Cracker, we've won, I think, what, three times now. Mm-hmm. Uh, we won the Forest Riders at Grandview. And the only thing we haven't won in the Pennsylvania small block stuff would be the Sixers. So we always, it's elusive. I mean, listen, anybody can look at the list of drivers that won it. There's not too many guys. There's a lot of first, there's a lot of one name guys done it multiple times. Um, so it's just always obviously a dream come true when you start racing to win that something. I mean, you know, the, the the jitters that go through yourself, I think the heat races are probably more stressful than the actual feature, but the jitters you have that day is crazy. It's just like uh, when you go to Oswego and run for a Super Dirt Car Series 200. It's, it's just about the same mentality of that, that same day because there's so much money on the line. And you got to, you know, if you don't pick well, you got to be smart and trying to get to the front. And, you know, listen, there's a lot of things that got to go your way that day, you know, um, and, and it all kind of went, good for us that day and we kept uh our head down and and just was patient and you know we almost like i said to you that i remember that day we thought we lost it when we were third and jeff was fourth and he made that split through the middle and you know we just tracked him down and tracked him down and our car stayed the same where i thought his got a little different toward the end and you know we made a good pass off a restart and you know that was you know history after that but just uh you know we're just gonna keep rocking the wave i mean it's just uh Seems surreal, you know. It's you know when you get up to work every day and you you work as hard as we do, just like everybody else in the racing world, and you work at night. It's you just keep uh, plugging away, and as you get older, you don't know when, you know that could, last week's win could be the last win I have the rest of the year. I won't know that, you know what I mean. But we're gonna try to win, but you got to take it like it was your last win. And as long as we all keep that mentality and keep working hard, I just think uh, you know good things are gonna happen. Absolutely, it's definitely being joined. We're being joined and, here by and, Ryan Godown on the Fredericksburg Eagle Hotel Hotline. If you have any questions, put uh, for Ryan, put them down there in the comments below. Sorry, Adam wanted to get the plug in there. And and you're not kidding about like how the 76 or day starts, like 8 a.m. tech. You know, like you're kind of loose at 8 a.m. tech, and then like the closer and closer you get to like four or five o'clock, like it starts to get real. But um, yeah, obviously, you know, you're looking to have a strong season this year. I'm assuming you're going to be trying to go after that money maker in a couple of weeks. How, how do you think you can build your momentum off of, you know, the 76er win plus Cherokee and Port Royal that to roll into yet another big paying race in Pennsylvania modified country? Well, unfortunately, um, Brett Deo's, well, not unfortunately, but unfortunate oh, problem hey. to have is Deo's Middletown race is the same day as money maker. So we hope, Maybe the weather takes a little screwball there and maybe we could offset it a little bit. But, uh, you know, we're obviously 
you know, leading the elite series, which who knows what happens after Middletown, but, you know, we kind of got to go with that right now with that mentality. I mean, you know, you go with a guy like Brett Deo, the money he's putting up is just incredible. And, uh, you know, us dirt modified guys are thankful for that because we usually don't get to run for that kind of stuff for that many races. And, uh, it's just incredible what he's put together and, you know, you gotta, we're all supporting him and, and he's doing a lot of great things. And, um, you know, it's, it's just incredible to be a part of But on the side note of Grandview. It's, it just stinks. You know, there's too many big races, not enough yeah. days to, to get all in, you know, and that's, you know, it kind of stinks for us. You know, we got two spec head cars sitting here waiting that are capable of winning, I'm sure, but it's a, you know, it's a wait and see and, you know, maybe rain will push something back and, we can make it, but uh, right now it's it's going to be tough to to figure out some of these races. I think next week we'll go to Middletown, Friday, Saturday, and then Bridgeport's on Sunday. So, you know, we're trying to do the week to week thing and see how things go and make sure we can get the supplies that we're getting tires and we're getting fuel and we're getting you know these race tracks are opening. And but uh, it's it's going to be uh, interesting this first month. You know, isn't it? Badass now that we have that kind of problem. It's a it's a good problem to have that you can go or have to pick and choose what race you want to go to, and they pay pretty well both times. But yet, you know, the sprint cars have always had an outlaw type schedule. The late malls have always had an outlaw type schedule. Modifieds in the Northeast haven't. I feel like Dale is bringing that now with that. The Elite Series is bringing up even the um, the North and South region. The money he's putting up. Super dirt car, their money's being pretty good. You know, it's kind you can almost have a pretty decent outlaw type schedule and almost not run for a drag championship somewhere, it seems like. It's starting to get to that point, don't you think? Absolutely. It's hard. You know, like we used to do a Friday, Saturday and do one midweek show here and there, you know. Now we X the Friday stuff because you would need six motors, spec head motors just to do it, you know, to do it right. Um and there's too much money online on them other races. I mean, why would you go to three hours away to run for three grand when you can go three hours away to run for five grand or, or 10 grand or 25 grand? I mean, it's, you know, and it's going to save on stuff. And, you know, what's happening is if you see some tracks are hurting for fans and hurting for this, where maybe in the future, some of these tracks run the modified division two times a month instead of four weeks a month and run for a bigger show to probably get more people to probably get better drivers and, like you said, it might go that way. I can tell you, you know, when you run modified on a weekly deal and you don't, you finish out of top three, you losing money that night. You know, you keep, you finish out of top three, you definitely lost money. So that's something that, you know, always keep in perspective on, you know, you look at the Deo's purse for the Cherokee race. I mean, I don't know. I forget what 15th paid, but it was, it was a crazy amount of money. Mm-hmm. So, you know, who knows what, how, all I know is we got to enjoy modified racing now with everything that's going on and all the, the money that's going out for us. And it's just cool that, you know, we're doing okay and, and just trying to do as good as we can every race, you know? Yeah, definitely. And it, Bert hit on it there a little bit. And so did you, but like modified racing is on the rise in my opinion. Like I've been around modifieds my entire life. I helped cold, cold Harris for as long as I can remember until he stopped racing a couple of years ago. But, you know, like you said, if you're outside of the top three, it's, you, you're not making money with, with especially the rising fuel prices for diesel, rising prices for the alcohol, for the car, VP, whatever. But it's it, it's insane to think that we have, like Brad said, so many different options to choose from and good paying options at that. Where years past, you know, you really only had your Sixer, your Coal Cracker, Dirt Week. Now it's it seems like there's a big race almost every weekend. Yeah. Yeah, and you looked. We raced into November to Louisiana, right? So you're giving the engine builder. We get back from Louisiana. You're giving the engine builder a couple months before you had to get ready for Cherokee, and you know it was it February? So you got to have all your ducks in a row and enough equipment to be able to run. There is no off season no more. That's the way I feel. Like I mean, you talk to some of the guys, and I don't run nowhere near a guy like Matt Shepard runs. He runs way more than probably tripled amount of races than I run. But I feel like we never stop either. You know, it's like, uh, it's just crazy. You can almost three to four times if you really want. You know, and we're going to different places too that are not used to modifieds. You know, obviously you just brought up Louisiana with the Cajun Swing with Deo. Now he went to Cherokee down at, you know, obviously a place that shows some success when COVID hit that, you know, Cherokee and then, uh, what was it, Tri-County. Um, you know, we're going to different places that modifieds aren't normally ran or even down Florida too. You got all tech. 
And that place is badass as well. I think, you know, that's a, that's a, everyone's been talking about Volusia with super dirt. All tech, I think puts on just as good a racing as what Volusia does down there. So it, it's also, we're getting you guys out in front of a new audience. And now modifieds are almost starting to become a national thing. You're starting to see a lot more and more people talk about the Northeast modifieds and not just be exposed to the UMP modifieds. There is a whole nother fan base out here. And I think it's really badass that we're starting to expand our our, uh, our 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 little niche here in the Northeast to those people as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think what obviously Dirt Track Digest and now Flow, it's crazy the amount of, uh, you know, what you're seeing. I mean, I've gotten over the last couple of races that we won, I've gotten people text me from California to Georgia to Florida no to shit. there just because they could see it now, you know, before they could see highlights a couple of days later uh, and see that, but they're watching the whole race and it's crazy. I mean, even, uh, even for sponsor help, it's been really good for us being at the flow and the viewership for us. It's been on the rise for us. So, which is a great sign because obviously we need sponsors to race, right? If we don't have sponsors, it's hard for us to do what we do. Um, so I think the whole broad perspective of it, I mean, it's just crazy to think about how far it's come in three years, and uh, it's it's great to be a part of right now. And speaking of Dirt Jack Digest, Kenny Bruce put in our comment section below, you need somebody to uh, uh, better to draw for you, apparently. So apparently you've been having yeah. some shit draws lately. Well, Cherokee, we didn't draw so good. It was my brother who drew Cherokee, and he wasn't so good. And then my the guy who owns the truck and trailer drew at Port Royal, and he drew the worst number in the bucket. Um, <laughs> so, you know, hopefully – <laughs> we got to cut it away. So maybe hopefully going to the middle town, we won't be so bad, but uh, it makes it fun. I mean, you know, people complain about the draw, you know, is it good? Is it bad? I don't know, but you know what? Brett Dale's consistent with it. And that's all you can ask for, right? He's not changing it every race, you know, pulling through the gate, what you got. And that's all you can ask for. That's all, all us racers ask for is a fair shot going through the gate. Yeah, definitely. That's, all anyone could really ask for these days and especially with how you know hinky some of the tracks can be with the rule books and packages and all that stuff you know it's it's nice that you can like you said show up to a racetrack and know everyone's on the same playing field for the most part unless you come with a spec head and everybody else is on a big block but i mean at that point <laughs> right but you know what you came with you know you know the rules and you know it's like i you just got to come with what you got the best way and hopefully it goes your way. Like, look at Mike Gula, right? He comes with a with a 360. He picks the pole in a heat race and picks the pole in a feature. I mean, if he picks the first heat race in the back, it's probably a different result because you need a little bit of power in the heat races there. Um, but he did good, and by the feature time, you didn't need it. So it all played in that favor. So some of it's just dumb luck, too. So it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's I don't want to start dead last in every heat race I go to. Trust me. Um, it's just harder. No. you got to make a little quicker um but at least you know what you got going through the gate and you know you try to do the best you can but it makes it fun though ryan i mean and from a i mean from a fan's perspective i like to see the bigger oh, yeah. guys start in the back that's why i don't like the timed hot laps or the qualifying i mean for a racer yeah it's better but i want to see a guy like yourself or cbd or shepherd or strunk i want to see those guys start in the back and try and work their way into the field here i mean from a fan that's more excitement for me but obviously from you guys, it's a lot more work and I, you, you can see both sides of this, but I want to sw circle back to something you mentioned there about, you know, how you said, if you don't run in the top three, you know, you're not making much money that can go for almost anywhere. And I feel so bad for like guys in New York that maybe only run or even like upstate Pennsylvania, like Penn can, and you go into, you know, the Southern tier of New York and even New York itself, we have it good in Pennsylvania, what, what we run to win, but through the field, it, I, I don't know what it is through the field person. I don't think, you know, it's as good as what, or it, New York's not as good as what we are. They're running for nothing up there from what it sounds like compared to what we got down here. So do you think that could change a little bit or are tracks starting to step up their full purse thing here? Well, you hope, you know, I don't think modified purses has changed in the last 20 years much, right? Mm -hmm. On a weekly deal, right? On a weekly Saturday, you get your specials, you get your specials. But, you know, it all comes down to is through the back gate. I mean, you know, listen, we need fans in the stands to be able to get our prices to be raised too. I mean, obviously the cost of putting a race on is more with insurance, the cost of our cars are going up. So to, for us to put a nice show on for you guys, it's tough. Um, 
I think it all needs to go up, honestly, in a perfect world. But at the end of the day, track's got to make money. If they don't make money, then we don't go. There's to no it. track. No track. So I don't know what the right thing to do is. I just, some of these shows, I wish were their top heavy, really. Maybe take maybe five grand of that and put it through the field. And I always said that for myself because I came from nothing, from street stock racing where the purse sucked, you know. Um, and I always think about them guys because that's where I was for years, you know, until I got to where we really worked hard to get to. You know, you worry about them guys because without them guys, we can't do what we do either. You know, we need everybody. It's not just the top guys, you know. Um, and I say that to all these guys that run these racetracks. I mean, you don't always got to wear run a top heavy. You, you take a, you know, a 25 grand a win show and make it 20 and put the five to the field. I don't think too many people are going to bitch about it, you know. Yeah, it, in, in the in the long run, you're, you're still going to get your car counts. I mean, people are going to show up to for six grand to win five grand to win, whatever it may be. But if you, if you spread the love a little bit back to the field and help out those guys that, you know, don't necessarily have a whole lot of sponsorship help, but without them, you're not getting a full field of race cars. You know, nobody right. wants to see a feature with 10 cars in it. I and mean, that's heat race no. at that point. <laughs> so, right. you know, spread the right. love throughout the field. You see what Brett's purse was at Cherokee, and like I said, even the back, it was insane. So, yeah. you know, it's just like some of these guys that put these big races on in our PA world over there, and even some in New Jersey. It's uh, you know, it's just you got to spread the love sometimes. You know, it's just uh, you don't see nobody close up either. So I get every angle. I don't know what the right decision is either way. All I know is we get our race car ready and just try to do the best we can and try to support every track that we can to do it. You know. Eat. Either way, somebody's going to bitch, and we all know it's, you know, nobody's ever going to be happy with, in a perfect world. It, there's never going to be a perfect world. Anyway, uh, so what's the plan look like for this year? Are we doing, are we running for a track champion? Uh, also, uh, we do have a comment here. Are we going to be uh, seeing you at Friday night at Big Diamond a couple times? Our buddy Brad Klinger checks in here. Uh, are we going to see you yeah. at Big Diamond a couple times this year? What's the, uh, what's the plan for you guys this year as well? So Big Diamond, we're hoping to get there in the beginning of the year as long as our spec motors. We're still waiting on a, a couple here. Um, so as long as we got enough motors to start the year, obviously we're going to go big diamond. They got a couple, couple good shows at the beginning of the year. Um, we're not going to run there all season, but we like to hit in the beginning of the year and then hit them at the end of the year there. Um, and then obviously we're going to run Bridgeport weekly for a championship again. And then, uh, you know, we're going to do the whole, as far as we can with the elite series. And then, um, we're going to do Brit, uh, Brett Dayo South series with the short track super series there. So, that's what we're going to do, definitely. So we're still going to try to do some midweek shows other than that. Maybe go up to Utica on a Friday. Maybe Albany on a Friday. Fonda, if we can. Um, maybe US 13 a couple times. They got a couple midweek shows. So there's options out there what we can go to. But it ultimately, it comes back to, number one, make sure our motors hold together. And make sure our cars hold together. And, you know, because obviously something happens behind us we got to make sure we can finish the whole year so we can't be trying to run and wear our stuff out right out of the gate either. You know? Yeah. You know, there's a lot of good, there's a lot of good shows this year, man. It's, I, I'm not, I wish I could be in that position here. Um, there is another a good question for you here. Does the current cost of fuel make you rethink your schedule at all? You know, obviously it goes without saying fuel prices are insane and God only knows what the summer is going to bring. Hopefully it brings some relief by the summer, but you know, the bastards, you don't know what's going to happen with them. Does this make you rethink your schedule at all with the way fuel prices are at the moment? It does. Now, if you're running it, it all, I mean, you say it offsets itself a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but you still got to look at it, right? I mean, it's still, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to go run for a 2000 to win show because that's three hours away because ultimately you're probably not going to make any money. You know, by the time you put fuel in a race car, fuel in a truck, and tires, you're either going to break even if you win or you're going to be minimal. So if you're less than an hour away from these racetracks, that's different. But if you're two to three hours away, that's going to be a little tough. Um, so we're trying to put a cap on it. The reason we want to go to Utica because there's an Elite Series race there. So we can go there a few times and learn mm -hmm. some, get a notebook there. Same thing with Fonda, kind of see where we're at. I think that's the only two tracks that with the whole rest of the elite series that we really need time at. So, um, obviously their pay is competitive, but you need a notebook too. So it's going to be like a double-edged sword there. Albany so, surprised me a little bit. The almighty notebook. 
<laughs> that surprised me a yeah. little bit when you said all but when you said Malta. We like Malta. We ran good there. I think we got second to Peter one night, and I love big block racing. I mean, I, I'll tell mm-hmm. you when it when when we ran Port Royal with the big block. I mean, that's where I started in New Egypt when they were big block racing. I mean, I love big block racing. Um, then when they all converted to spec head, spec head, spec head racing, it's good, it's fun, it's affordable around here. But there ain't nothing mm-hmm. by strapping in and getting your ass in a seat and running a big block. There really isn't. So um, <laughs> that's just my opinion, and. Who knows? But uh, yeah, we're gonna try traveling around a little bit. It's it's too early to tell yet exactly what we're doing. We just want to get our whole arsenal together. We're there, we're almost there. We got about another week or two where we're gonna have you know our two specs together and our two outlaw on a big block car. That's where we got. Um, that's what we aim for over the winter. I think we're on schedule, and it's all about keeping your equipment fresh, your motors good, and. Just keeping your head down in the grind, man. It's, it's, uh, you know, we, my work, we do landscaping. So my work right now is nuts. Um, we get home from Port Royal and 6 a.m. We're up mulching. Um, just, just no downtime right now for me. But once we get the cars together and we get a little bit of a routine going on, it gets easier for us as the year goes on. Yeah, definitely. And I, we got one more question before we let you get out of here. Um, Scotty Deal wants to know if your son is going to be racing at all this year. Yeah, he's got his car. He's at, we're actually scaling it right now in the shop. Um, okay. Obviously, Bridgeport did again, but being that they canceled, um, he's not obviously going to race anywhere this weekend. So, yeah, he's going to be at Bridgeport. I think next weekend that's great. So he'll start there first race. Obviously, Georgetown was supposed to be it. So he's on board, ready to go. He's going to do Bridgeport on Saturdays and do all the the day of South stuff with the crate car. So that'll be awesome. That's awesome. How 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 much fun has it been helping out the boy with that stuff? You know, getting into a new adventure with him. You know, it's kind of weird. You got to kind of tell apart which twenty six is twenty six. But it, it's I've been enjoying watching your boy race. How's it feel? You know, being out there with well, not with him yet, but I'm sure sooner or later we'll get him in a modified. Yeah, I mean, it's I think it's more nerve wracking to watch him than me actually race. <laughs> the, you know, when you when you're used to driving and you got to watch, it's like you're trying to drive for him. And but he's he's doing good. He's got his head down this year. He's really grinding over the winter. He did a lot of work, um, rebuild his whole car again um, with all fresh stuff. So hopefully, you know, it all transpires into some wins for him and he keeps his head down and uh, gets gets a lot of wins this year. Well, hopefully it does. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for your time, man. Uh, you know, we've been trying to set this up for a while and I'm glad time. We've been trying to get, you know, good talk to you, man. It's, you know, I always have a fun interview with you and uh, who do you got to thank for? We let you get out of here for the uh, night. Who do you got to thank for getting you up and down the road? Well, we got to thank uh, Mike Carlucci with RM Motorsports. Uh, with me and him, obviously we can't build the, the kingdom we're building right now with that. Um, and then obviously all my sponsors camp out, Ellery's bar and grill weekend archery, um, Izzy Trucking and Rigging, Kobe Towing, Joy Auto Parts, Montros Molders, uh, Creston Hydraulics, Ball Snow Plows, um, TMI Trucking, uh, Trick Race Parts, uh, Metal Fab, Ability Kit Engines. I mean, the list goes on. I, I just don't want to forget anybody. All my product sponsors, these guys all really, uh, Bicknell Race Cars, they just all give me what I need to to perform right now and I, I can't thank them all enough to support me absolutely ryan and you are kicking some ass right now and i'm sure we'll be talking to you a couple times this year yet as well good luck through you the rest of the year man like i said i'm sure we'll be talking to you and uh, we'll see you probably in a couple weeks here i imagine probably a big dime or something like that or grandview or wherever the hell we'll, we'll catch up somewhere i don't know where but whenever yeah. we get to a modified race we'll definitely catch up buddy well hopefully the rain goes and we could get to that money maker that would be nice somewhere along the line we're we look oh, forward I to that so it. you know See what happens. I hope it's hopefully it's a lot warmer too than this weekend. God damn it, I hate this weather. Well, uh, next week ain't looking too warm either, so it's gotta get warm. Shut up. If we don't talk about it, it can't happen. If we don't talk about it, it can't yeah. happen. I'd take another <laughs> snow a little bit. Get out get the hell out of here. Go. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> take care, Ryan. See you, buddy. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen. Ryan, go down on the Fredericksburg Eagle Hotel Hotline. Fantastic interview. We got to talk to Mud Turtles tonight, Adam. What a, oh, that was a lot of fun. Good, uh, good conversation with Ryan. I found it funny, you know, he brought up Mike's engine at Port Royal. And now we'll get into a little bit of Port Royal here before we get off the air here. Um, you know, you can run 
a small a, a board out small block up there, which I guess the three six would be considered a small block hit, right? Or would that be a big block? Small block. Small block, okay. But with the way a daylight surface track slicks off, yes. The way port roll slicks off, yes, you can run that. And how can Oh absolutely. You you even if you catch a later heat race, I mean you might if you're say you're starting at the back, you can easily get into a qualified spot. You're not gonna go tense the first in it, but you know, one big blocks are nice when the track is nice and heavy and juiced up because you have enough power to get through there, but once the track slicks off, you don't really need big block power. I mean, yes, it's a big fast half mile, but Mike proved it there. You can get around with a small block just fine through the slick. Yes, absolutely. And it was a fantastic race between him and Ryan. And uh, hopefully, if you get a chance to watch it on Flow, do it, please. But a fantastic interview with Ryan Go Down. Uh, of course, you know, Go Down picked the win at Port Royal on Sunday alongside Anthony Macri, which there was no controversy in that whatsoever. Um, and uh, we also had Colton Flinner pick up the late model win as well. All right. We've been on this era for almost two hours here in a great, it's mostly, we blame Hannah Newhouse for that, but oh, yeah. uh, thanks two for great interviews. Mm-hmm. Two great interviews. Two great interviews. Two great interviews. All right. Fun. Time to, uh, oh, by the way, Ryan uh, said uh, uh, he forgot to thank his crew, which good job, Ryan. Uh, he forgot to thank the crew. Uh, hold on, let me get the message. Up Those here, guys right? are kind of important. Uh, <laughs> they are very important here. Uh if you get shout out specifically his brother Butchie, so yeah, so uh, there you go, Ryan's uh, brother Butchie uh, and, and the crew. Uh, so give him shit for that. Make him buy you beer for for getting you guys on the uh, interview here. So mm-hmm. damn drivers, I tell you what, selfish, 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 selfish. <laughs> oh boy! All right, ask your questions. What do you got? What do you got for the rest of the night here? Uh, I guess a good question is. I got nothing, but um, who's your picks? I'm going to go. All right. Uh, Saturday's a wash, I think, Saturday's in my opinion. Wash, yes. Port Royal, I think. Like, it's not going to race. Um, so that leaves Williams Grove Friday, Sillings Grove Sunday. Um, mm-hmm. Which I'm, I'm not go, feeling good about Sunday. Uh, I'll be on the chilly side, but I think manageable. It's a day show, for Christ's sake. Um, True. Hmm. I don't know. I I gotta think. Uh, little Freddie is gonna get a win at Williams Grove this week, and I think Double D keeps it hot at Seelands Grove. I like I like Danny at Seelands Grove, but I'm gonna go with Mac for at Seelands Grove, and then I'm gonna go with um. You know what? Danny gets it on Friday night. I'll go Danny Friday night. Late model side cool, things dude. in on- a minute. Friday night, I say, I'll go scrub. I'll go scrub. Even though Saturday looked really good last week, I'll go scrub. Yeah, scrub started night. showing a lot of speed towards the end of the weekend. So, yep. uh, Outlaws this weekend, uh, they are at uh, Bakersfield tomorrow night. Then they go to Paris, which I love Paris. Cannot wait to watch uh, Paris on Saturday night. Um, and then Vallejo, or Vado, uh, New Mexico. That's a fun little joint out there. Uh, we saw some mm-hmm. really good things. I believe that's where they had the Wild West shootout this past year, right? Where the, if I'm yeah. correct. Yeah. They had some yeah. really, really good racing out there at Vado. So uh, Tuesday, first Tuesday night show of the year, by the way, for the Outlaws. Uh, coming up here I like uh, it. next week. I like it. Uh, uh, I think Donnie rebounds for a win this weekend after some hard luck last weekend. Um, I'm going to say Donnie. Shuhart picks up a win, a much needed win at that. And oh God, Sheldon's bad fast right now. I think he steals a win somewhere. I will go with I don't know where, but I will go with Mesita Gravel Sweet. Yeah, like in in no pick particular order was no my pick. I'm just saying, like at some point this weekend, those three are going to get your win. So I think yeah. that's a better way to pick it uh, with the outlaws. Uh, late model side of things, Cherokee. Now here's the thing: Smokey is on the XR series side of things at Bristol, which I think Smokey wins that. Uh, but late models, um, Cherokee, Dale McDowell. I'll go Dale McDowell. 
gets one this weekend, and Shepard gets one. Yeah, I'm going to agree to both of those picks. Believe it or not, those are solid picks. Yeah. Even though, because I, I, yeah, I think that's just solid. By the way, shout out to Jimmy Owens. Uh, picked up a win at Atomic, or not Atomic, uh, yeah, Atomic um on sunday and our boy devin moran's leading the points at the well or lucas or late model so mm-hmm. all right let's get the hell out of here chris are you alive yeah man hey what do we got coming up on national racing network coming up tonight actually next shortly here will be the indy pro 2000 championship on iRacing, and then i am out of here for a week we'll be doing remote productions on the road we'll try Figure out what we're doing with you two. Uh, I will be down working the Freedom 500 with Cletus McFarlane. Biggest car YouTuber on the planet right now. Um, 20 Something nitrous fueled Crown Vicks kind of jealous. at DeSoto Speedway yeah. sounds completely badass. The cameras yeah, will be I'm, coming with me, that's for sure. I'm, I'm actually yes, thoroughly jealous. Um, and what, what uh, does hope the winner get for uh, people that... May not know what did a winner? Isn't it like a Lambo or something? Uh, yeah, first place that whoever which of the celeb ish YouTuber types that are driving in this thing, the winner's going home with a Lambo. Boy, it must really <laughs> suck to be poor. It must really yes. suck to be poor. Um, oh. And quite frankly, I'm excited to get to go shoot some pictures. Hopefully, at Desoto Speedway. It's now called the Freedom Factory, but Desoto Speedway ran everything pavement late models super late models sprint cars you name it DeSoto Speedway was a speed palace in the southeast so very cool to get to go shoot there very cool and yeah Chris have fun with that and hopefully we'll be uh we'll see how next week goes and hopefully we'll have a show by the way uh, I want to do put this out there uh uh, for the month of April, our schedule is going to look a little bit different. We'll get in that here, but obviously we're going to have hopefully have the show next week. If we don't, we'll be back on the 7th. And then after that, we're going to take the next two weeks off then in April for the 14th, which uh, weather depending, first of all, with because uh, URC is going to be up at Bloomsburg on that Thursday night. The following Thursday night is going to be um, the All-Stars of Bloomsburg. So we're going to take the uh, two Thursdays off in April, but then we'll be back then for a good bit of the month of May then, but we'll get in that a little bit more. We'll figure out if we can. Yeah, we'll get you tonight. guys on a Wednesday or something. Yeah. We'll, we'll, figure we'll run out. shows we'll those figure things. We'll figure, we'll figure something out as they get closer. But ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you so much for joining us on the High Side Hustle here tonight. A, a very special two-hour show tonight. Thank you for sticking with us. Uh, once again, thanks to all of our great sponsors. Uh, 34 Motorsports, a great ticker down below. Sean and Amber at 34 are great people. Uh, go check them out for all your safety equipment needs, and thanks for sponsoring the ticker. Uh, of course, uh, on the Frenchburg Eagle Hotel Hotline. By the way, happy anniversary, Mike and Jamie. Uh, Mike and Jamie Southworth celebrating their anniversary today. Um, thank you guys so much for sponsoring us as well and everything you do for racing. Go check out uh, Frenchburg Eagle Hotel on Facebook. Great specials, best wings in the area, bar none. Um, massive beer selection. Just go go check the Eagle out. You want a good time, a good food, good people, and go ask for a purple, purple Hooter shot too. Speaking of the Eagle, before we get out of here, we tried to go there last weekend, right? Okay. Of course, they were having their big Patty's Day thing. So this Mm -hmm. just tells you how popping of a place that is. The wait time for five people was upwards of an hour and a half. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's that's a happening place, but it's worth it. Yeah. It's worth the wait. Absolutely. But yeah, so good on Mike, good on all them at the Eagle. Uh, but thank you so much for your support. And thank you so much uh, to Finch's Meat Markets, where nobody beats his meat. Let's get the fuck out of here. Mike, Mike Finch. All right. Thank you so much to Hand Newhouse and Ryan Godown. Join us on the Fredericksburg Eagle Hotel Hotline. Also, Alan Grace and Hachi Racer for the mass, for the big flag behind us here. Go Villanova. Uh, good luck to uh, everyone this weekend for racing somewhere. For, for, for Chris Graham. And Big Sexy Adam Rubright. My name is Burt Wojcik. Keep on hustling, folks. We will see you guys next week right here on the High Side Hustle. Enjoy the races.